Hi everyone, welcome to the respiratory failure video. So just start off with a few questions to see what you already know. So the first question is, what happens to the CO2 level in someone with type 2 respiratory failure? Does it increase, stay the same or decrease? So think about a condition which you know would develop type 2 respiratory failure and the underlying mechanisms and how the ventilation will be affected here. So it will be increased. The typical picture of type 2 respiratory failure is low oxygen with high carbon dioxide. Next question. What is the normal partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood? Now this is something that's quite tricky and just need to learn it but I put it in here because it's good to understand how the partial pressure of oxygen will change throughout the body and how it differentiates from the atmospheric oxygen you would breathe in to what the partial pressure will be once it leaves the tissues. So it would be 75 to 100. Last question, what is the definition of hypoxia? High or low oxygen? And it would be low oxygen. This leads nicely into the respiratory failure presentation because low oxygen underpins respiratory failure. So this is just a overview of what we will be covering today and it will end with some summary questions. So what is respiratory failure? Essentially it's when the respiratory system fails to carry out gas exchange adequately. It will result in an abnormal level of oxygen where it will be low and whether it's type 1 or type 2 carbon dioxide will also be affected. So type 1 presents with low oxygen on a normal carbon dioxide and type 2 with the low oxygen again but with a high carbon dioxide and the difference between this depends on what underlying condition is causing the respiratory failure. So to tell the difference between the two you would essentially look at the carbon dioxide. Respiratory failure can also be classified into acute or chronic. This is less common. Acute would be a life-threatening derangement in the AVGs and it present very quickly um, within hours. A chronic is something that you would more likely see um, someone on the ward who has a severe long-standing health condition and they would have developed this type of respiratory failure and the signs are often more subtle because they would have undergone compensation. Acute on chronic is when this person on the ward, say they've had COPD for 30 years, gets an acute exacerbation of their COPD. So pathophysiology of type 1 respiratory failure. It is most commonly due to a VQ mismatch. And what I mean by this is when the ventilation or perfusion has changed and the other has stayed the same. So for example, in interstitial lung disease, you get a decrease in the ventilation because the parenchymal disease makes diffusion worse whereas you're still getting all that blood flow to the alveoli so you'll get a mismatch an odd ratio with a pe if you think about it the other way around you would have over perfusion or no perfusion at all to some areas of the lung however there'd still be all that air going into those alveoli sacs so that'd be normal it can also less commonly be to a shunt so this would cause hypoxemia but the carbon dioxide wouldn't be affected. So this type of respiratory failure can also be termed hypoxemic respiratory failure because the main abnormality here is the low oxygen. So the typical causes, I like to break it down into three different causes underpinning this respiratory failure. So either the atmospheric oxygen entering the alveoli can be affected. For example, in high altitude, the oxygen will be at a low partial pressure, or the actual alveoli itself can be thickened due to parenchymal disease. For example, in interstitial lung disease, 
or infections such as pneumonia and this will mean the diffusion is poorer or it can be due to a reduced blood flow so there's not enough blood flow getting to the alveoli for example in a pulmonary embolism so if any three of these things are affected then you will present with a type 1 respiratory failure picture so type 2 pathophysiology it's essentially you're not getting enough air into or out of that alveolus so this can also be termed hypercapnic respiratory failure because the carbon dioxide will be high this is because you won't be getting enough air into the alveoli but also because that ventilation isn't occurring you also get a build up of the carbon dioxide so it will be raised so typical causes the most common one is COPD or asthma if you think about all of that bronchoconstriction and mucus that's there it'll be hard for the air to get in and out of the alveoli also other conditions such as GBS or scoliosis can cause it because if you're not able to move your thoracic cavity then you won't be able to draw that air into your lungs but also you won't be able to expel it um, it can also be caused centrally by drugs such as opioids or anesthetics this just is an overview of the causes of type 2 respiratory failure broken down into acute and chronic this just shows you that with respiratory failure it's not a disease in itself it's caused by so many different types of disease such as a stroke if you have a stroke you can be at risk of developing type 2 respiratory failure eventually so it's really common in long-term severe conditions but also such the conditions such as the flail chest which is an acute condition or an asthma attack so it can present with a lot of different things so these are the symptoms that you would expect in someone with respiratory failure remember they're going to have oh sorry they're going to have an underlying condition on top of these so essentially these are symptoms you'd be a patient would be complaining of when they have a lower concentration of oxygen in their blood so shortness of breath compensatory mechanism by the body would be to increase respiratory rate if you don't have enough oxygen things like a bluish tint to the lips and fingernails suggesting cyanosis that would be due to another compensatory mechanism where the blood would be redirected to the vital organs if there isn't enough oxygen so low oxygen essentially underpins these wheezing and productive cough are symptoms of asthma and copd so you could you are likely to see that as well in a presenting patient um, fatigue and daily headache are also signs of hypercapnia so that would be more of a type 2 picture so these are the signs which you would ex want to look for on examination focusing on polycythemia and core pulmonale these are signs of chronic hypoxemia so someone who's really trying to compensate for this low oxygen in their blood so with the core pulmonale, if the lungs aren't working well and they're not well ventilated, then the person could develop pulmonary hypertension. In turn, this could lead to a fluid overload in the right ventricle and would lead to core pulmonale. Also, another compensatory mechanism for low oxygen would be to produce more red blood cells, leading to polycythemia. And also tachycardia is more of an acute presentation of having low oxygen in the blood so clinical examination history for respiratory failure is essentially the person already has an underlying condition so you would need to take a really detailed history to try and work out why they're presenting with these symptoms so once you know the underlying condition you'll have a better picture of what to expect particularly in the abgs type 2 especially would present with respiratory acidosis due to the high carbon dioxide and then whether it's compensated or not compensated and this could tell you how long the condition's been going on for in a chest x-ray and ct scan you'd be looking for things such as pulmonary edema or 
in a chronic picture, someone with COPD, that typical barrel chest presentation, or say someone with scoliosis. But that should be picked up quite early. So a few OSCE tips is essentially what I think might come up um, a lot in these OSCEs. So the first question is, what is the difference between the peak flow of COPD and asthma? So thinking back to what the classification of COPD and asthma is in terms of lung function tests. So COPD and asthma are both obstructive lung diseases. So they'll both have a low FEV1 to FBC ratio and also a low FEV1. However, you can tell the difference between the two because when you, the person will take an inhaler, if they have asthma, the results will normalise. What type of breathing could you expect to hear in someone with COPD? So taking it back to the breathing point, this is really important to know the difference between bronchial and vesicular breathing. So a good tip that I learned was if you get your stethoscope, place it over your trachea and then breathe in and out. This is typical bronchial breathing because you get that gap in between the inspiratory and expiratory phase. So essentially COPD would be bronchial, not vesicular breathing. Because when the air moves through the lungs, you would expect to hear a continuous sound over the alveoli as that air gets into the alveoli. However, with someone with COPD or asthma, because their lungs are so blocked up, you would hear that gap because that air isn't getting fully ventilated into the alveoli. Next up, what type of respiratory failure causes respiratory acidosis? So it would be type 2 because there's a high carbon dioxide. So just an overview of treatment, it would be mainly supportive and trying to manage the underlying condition that's causing all of these symptoms. The preferred option is this one, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. This is because uh, the patient is in control, they're conscious and there's no invasive procedure going on so there's less complications. And this is what you typically see on the ward, that patient with COPD just requiring that extra top up of oxygen. So a few summary questions just to see what you guys have learned. So the first one, what happens to the CO2 level in someone with type 2 respiratory failure? So this is similar to the first question you had. Is it increased, normal or decreased? So it will be increased. So I also thought I'd throw in an ABG. I'll give you a minute to pause this to have a look at the results and compare it to the normal results over here. Okay, so these are your options. Break it down to type 2 and type 1. There are two types of type 2, acute and chronic. So here you'll be thinking about compensation and what the pH is looking like. Okay, so the answer would be chronic type 2 respiratory failure. So breaking it down, you'd be having a look at the oxygen, which is low, and the carbon dioxide, which is high. So typically a type 2 picture. However, the pH is normal, just about, and the bicarbonate is low. So this would suggest a compensated picture because there's been time for the body to get that pH back to normal. So final question, what will cause type 1 respiratory failure? So having a think about the underlying cause of type 1 respiratory failure, what's going on pathophysiology wise? So if you remember, it would be a VQ mismatch. So the answer would be a pulmonary embolism. This is because um, in a pulmonary embolism, areas of the lung would get low perfusion if it's been redirected elsewhere. Um, however, even though the perfusion is all affected, you would still get normal ventilation in and out of the alveoli. So this will result in a high VQ ratio. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions and suggestions or improvements, please feel free to comment as well. Thank you.